This is all about creating your digital impression through campaigns, and this is about reaching your constituents, reaching your members, reaching the people who you care so much about. And we are very fortunate here. I'm going to let the panel introduce themselves, but I do want to have a chance to introduce, here we go, Brad Fitch. He is a man who's worn many hats in this town for 25 years as a journalist, as a congressional aide, as a consultant, as an entrepreneur, as a writer, as a researcher, uh, as a professor at American University. Uh, literally, it's a 32-page bio. So I'll, I'll uh, uh, allow him to, to fill you in a little bit more on that. But uh, please join me in welcoming the moderator for our In Case You Missed It, Making a Digital Impression Through Campaigns uh, format here, Mr. Brad Fitch. Thank you very much. Thank you. Delighted to be here at the museum. Um, we do have a, uh, a distinguished panel that we are going to allow themselves to introduce. And this is going to be a very somewhat informal, as you can imagine, kind of a gathering um, and hopefully a little enlightening uh, as well and maybe even a little funny. So what I'm going to kick this off right now is uh, to ask our panelists, and we'll start at the far end with, with Soren to introduce themselves, but we're also asking them as they introduce themselves to try to give us a little bit of information, a little data. So they've been asked, they can answer one of three questions. What is the best practice that you've seen in social media? What is the worst practice or tactic or strategy? Or what is the strangest that you have seen? And so I've invited them to answer any one of those three questions, but let them introduce themselves and tell a little bit about yourself and uh, answer one of, that, one of those three questions. Uh, hi, I'm Soren Dayton. Uh, I work at a, at a public affairs firm in Washington, uh, public, uh, Prison Public Affairs previously at New Media Strategies and the McCain campaign and came and worked on the Hill for a couple of years and so bounced back between the Hill and politics and things like that. Now settled sort of in, you know, helping organizations do advocacy. Uh, I would I would say the the worst practice, and this is gonna sound a little old school maybe for this crowd, but forgetting email People, people seem to think that, you know, sometimes people get really excited by Facebook and Twitter and all these other things, but email is the cheap, easy, long-form way to communicate with people, and also it's a little bit more private sometimes, so you can sometimes do a little bit more. And so my, the, the thing I always encourage people I work with is remember all the ways you need to communicate with someone and that, and, and when you do that, don't forget the power of email and sort of reaching into people and communicating with them directly. Great. Liz? I'm Liz Mayer. I am the founder and president of Mayer Strategies, LLC. We're about 18 months old. And prior to that, I was with a firm called Heinz Communications. Prior to that, at New Media Strategies, briefly with Soren. And prior to that, I was the Republican National Committee's online communications director during 2008. Um, I've consulted on a number of campaigns, including Scott Walker's recent recall election and also Carly Fiorina's U.S. Senate bid in California. But principally, what our firm focuses on is advising Fortune 500s and major advocacy groups on their online communication strategy with regard to public affairs issues. Um, as for the question, I'd like to highlight two things, if I may. Best, um, I always look at Twitter. I'm a heavy Twitter user. And I would encourage you to check out the history of Claire McCaskill's Twitter feed. I think she's very good on Twitter. She doesn't actually follow a lot of people. In fact, she may not be following anybody technically, but she always responds to things. Um, and I think that that's a very interesting and important strategy and something that probably in the context of what's proving to be a surprisingly tough re-election race is serving her well. Um, I would also like to do uh, not necessarily weirdest, but most interesting. If you haven't looked at what PETA does with regard to gaming, go take a look at it. It's very interesting how they push their narratives and their messages by using games. And that's something that's not necessarily easily adapted everywhere, but I think is something that more and more advocacy organizations are taking a look at. Great. Um, Stephen, number one. Um, hi, Steve, Steve Dwyer. I work for um, Democratic Whip Steny Hoyer in the House. Um, I've actually been with them for almost 10 years. Um, my title uh, has changed a lot over the years, uh, new media director, online communications director. Lately, I guess most people are settling in on digital director. Um, I also handle some policy for them. Uh, I will take a stab at the weirdest. It's not all that social in nature, but four or five years ago, uh, a group that was opposed to immigration and wanted a wall built 
on the Mexican border, um, mailed thousands of bricks to Capitol Hill, uh, actual bricks, and they encouraged all of their users to do so. Um, I, I imagine it was pretty expensive to mail each one of those bricks, so uh, I don't know how effective the campaign was. It certainly was weird. It was kind of effective, though, because certainly every office knew about it uh, throughout the, uh, all over the hill. And how's that wall coming along? Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what happened to those bricks. Uh, you know. Stephen, number two. Right, sure. I'm Stephen Dagadakis. I'm the Deputy Executive Director of the House Democratic Caucus. Uh, and one of my responsibilities is overseeing uh, new media operations for our caucus office. And we work with the other Democratic leadership offices, including uh, Mr. Hoyer, uh, to help de deliver the Democratic message to members and uh, work on training staff and members on how you use new media. Um, leading to, I think, one of the also another weird instance of uh, new media usage on the Hill was. Uh, Sure, if many of you have seen uh, Stephen Colbert on his show does something called Get to Know a Member, and basically he does a short segment where he peppers members with a bunch of ridiculous questions and tries to make fun of them. So they were having difficulty naturally getting members to participate, so they called around to each of the offices and asked for an email address. And you know, many of them thought that you know they'd, it was some booker for the show, so they passed along the communications director email address. What happened was they put these email addresses. Uh, into a program on their website. So anybody, and then they told everybody who's a fan of uh, the Colbert Show to go to the website, sign up, and send an email. And all those emails went directly to the comm director. So you literally had staff who were getting thousands of emails, and our internal email list blew up. And it started like, are you getting a couple emails about this? And they're getting hundreds of emails. And it's like suddenly it went to heads will roll. Uh, so. If you're doing any kind of online advocacy campaign, and the lesson from that is to make sure you get the right emails and you're targeting the right person in the office. Good story. Scott? Good morning, everybody. Scott Williams, and Vice President at Men's Health Network. I've been there for about eight years, and, and before joining Men's Health Network, spent time in industry and also uh, working up on Capitol Hill as well. I guess one of the, the weirdest, the uh, best and probably most humorous things I've seen on social media, but also in terms of viral videos, was how many of you guys here are Everybody Loves Raymond fans? We got anybody in here? Yeah, we got quite a few. So how many of you remember uh, Brad Garrett with uh, Stand Up the Cancer several years ago? You guys remember him bending over a table on live TV to get his digital rectal exam uh, from a gentleman in a uh, white lab coat uh, who approached him uh, subtly from behind, unbeknownst to him, uh, came up with the two fingers and was about ready to uh, go get him and test his prostate health live on TV to raise awareness of prostate cancer and men's health issues. That video went viral all over the web, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, blogs, you name it. So Brad Garrett forever is famous, is known as that uh, guy who, who on TV got a digital rectal exam to support prostate health and men's health. But it worked, raising awareness. Well, that's definitely a don't try that one at home story. Um, <laughs> OK, uh, well, we're going to kick things off a little bit with a little uh, research just to frame it and then go back to our panel. And if you could bring up the, the research slides that we sent, the Congressional Management Foundation did a survey uh, a couple of years ago of congressional staff. Over 300 uh, staff members participated in this survey. And we got some really interesting findings with regard to social media. So this is staff answering this question. In your opinion, how important are the following for understanding views and opinions of members of Congress. So we're looking at how, what are they using to understand views and opinions. And as you can see from the, the next slide um, that comes up, um, if you want to show the, the answers here, is the traditional forms of media are still dominant, such as attending events in the district, personalized messages. But um, take a look at where Facebook comes in at 64% um, uh, of the staff say that Facebook is somewhat or very important for understanding views and opinions. And what we found in follow-up research, and, and I'd like some of the perhaps sales staffers to talk about this, is what we found is that members will post comments or videos or something, usually related to an activity that they're engaged in, a bill that they're introducing, or something of that nature, and they'll post it, and then they'll look for an instantaneous reaction. So the message there is it's hard to start a dialogue with members of Congress on a new topic, but if they're talking about something, they are looking for people's opinions. And we did a, a, a session uh, for one of our uh, uh partners, our supporters, uh, and did a webinar and had a staff member, and the staff member said, yeah, if we see 20 or 30 comments, it's something we pay attention to. And the number that she used was 20 or 30. Um, the next slide actually flips it around the other way and it asks this question. In your opinion, how important are the following for communicating the members or senators' views and activities? If we could take it to slides to the, to the next uh, slides. Um, and 
There we go. And, in, and this is, so we flipped the question. So it's how important uh, is social media and other activities for communicating the members' views? And what we found is local media responding to constituent communications. If you can move to the, uh, the next slide, thank you. Um, local media response to constituent mail, these are still dominant. But look at where Facebook and YouTube come in at 74, 72%. These are huge numbers. In fact, in our report, um, at hashtag social Congress, the Congressional Management Foundation concluded that social media has been adopted greater and faster than any technology in the history of the modern Congress. They've really adapted um, and really are aggressively going at it. The Democrats and Republicans have contests with each other uh, over who's got the best and who's got the fastest and who's got the most tweets. So we thought that'd be helpful to just give you a little data to frame um, the discussion. I'm not going to go back to our panelists with a, with a couple of questions and try to draw them out a little bit. And we are going to start at the strategic level. And I'll start with Scott over here and just try to move quickly through the panel. But strategically, what rules do you follow? What are some of the guiding principles that you think of or that you try to communicate to your staff or your colleagues when you consider interacting in social media? Excellent. Thank you, Brad. That's a great question. So first off, I have to recognize my colleague, Kamaya Dixit, who's here in the room. She is our social media guru and our communications director. So Kamaya, the way we've, we've set it up from a strategic standpoint organizationally, our mission is to reach men and their families where they live, work, play, and pray. So to that end, it's absolutely critical for us to bring, bring humor to what we do to get men to perk up and pay attention to health messages all across the nation and in local communities. One of the things that we've done as an organization is we've appointed Kamaya to be that, that one person organizationally who is going to do all things social media for us. We don't have uh, 12 or 15 staff members on social media. All things go through Kamaya. So for, for her, it's about striking a balance with humor but also timely information. So it's about uh, crafting a solid message, uh, getting it out in a timely fashion. Uh, it's really making sure that we're, we're honing the message in a way that our, our constituency and our men can both uh, understand and they feel comfortable in wanting to engage with that message. So having internal staff are driving the process. Absolutely. Stephen? Sure. So one of the things we first do is develop what message, figure out what we want to get out, and then who our target audiences, and then think about which of the social networks are most effective to doing that. So for example, if we have breaking news or something like a news article that we want to get out, we'll usually send it out on our Twitter account, at House Democrats. Um, or if we want something that might last for a few more days, kind of a general topic we want to talk about over the course of a week, we might post it on Facebook because generally, uh, the length of time that pe people are able to see that post on Facebook is, you know, about two days versus on Twitter, you know, the shelf life of a tweet is very short. Um, <clears throat> one thing for us, even though we all do go through one staffer, you know, the communication director generally has to approve everything that gets put out. Um, we much more so social media is now a part of every single staffer and our entire operation. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, um, it was mainly me, you know, having to repackage all the content that was coming from everywhere else in our operation and having to customize it and 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 you know tailor tailor it specific for the different social media sites. But that's really changed just in the past year or so. Where um, and part of that is because all of our actual staffers, whether they're policy staffers or um, or administrative staffers or press staffers. Uh, they all are using social media more and more in their own lives, obviously, and they, um, so now it's whoever originally comes up with the content in the office, whether that's a policy staffer or a press staffer, it's their job now to um, think through all the different social networking sites that they want to put it on, and then also to customize it in those different areas. Um, so I think it's really much more of a teamwork, it's just really at the core of, of everything we do now. Liz? Um, I often say to people to think about uh, technology and tools that are available to you like a Q-tip. That may sound odd, but I'm guessing when I say Q-tip, the men in the audience think about things like car de detailing. Um, many people, both genders, probably think about cleaning your ears. Women may think about makeup. The point here being that all of these tools and technologies have multiple purposes don't think of them as just one thing. If you think of Twitter as just a broadcast tool, you're not going to get full benefit from it because it's a great way of gauging opinion, engaging in dialogue with people, that kind of thing too. And I think that applies for the other tools and technologies as well. Um, so, so one of the things that, that in, in picking up on a number of these points and actually the last slide you showed, I think one of the critical components of all of this that, that we sort of think about, or you know, we, we know but don't necessarily think about, is the power of it being public. And you know, members of Congress get, get emails and they get faxes and phone calls. 
But when they get 20 comments on their Facebook page, everybody else is noticing too. The media is noticing. And, and so the, what, what, I think one of the most important things is not just to express your idea or your position, but to express it in a way that there's external accountability for. To, to make that argument so that other people have to understand it, or so other people can perceive it. And also it helps build a sort of daisy chaining effect where people are like, oh yeah, I'm with that too. And that works in all sorts of advocacy formats and, and everything else. I mean, that's in some ways the same thing as a yard sign in a campaign or on you know, some issue or something like that. I want to keep this as interactive as possible, and, and so if you have a question or you have a thought as one of the panelists you're talking, please raise your hand, try to get my attention. We're talking now at the strategic level, so if you have any thoughts or questions for an individual panelist that you'd like them to follow up on or amplify, please feel free to um, raise a question. Yes, ma'am, right up here. We've got a microphone coming up here so everyone can hear you. Yeah, this is very old-fashioned, but so I want to ask your opinion of it. My organization, let's say, starts a new project and we create a web page our web pages and it, it'll be on, it'll be on the overall organization but it'll be we'll have a separate web web page for announcing that that project is that just hopelessly old-fashioned and useless no oh. Liz, you spoke up first. What do you think? Uh, well, I think we probably did simultaneously, but, but I'll, 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 use, I'll use ladies first to my advantage here. There you go. Um, no, I think it's useful. I think one of, the, one of the reasons that in my business that I see most utility in that is when a reporter goes to write a story, reporters have limited amounts of time. They're often on deadlines. They're often strapped with trying to cover like six different things. If they're covering what you're doing, it is far better to have a single place where all of the relevant information that you would want that person to see exists. Because first of all, you're busy. If they call, you can refer them to that. Second of all, they're busy. If they've got stuff that they can cut, copy, and paste, links that they can click on that direct them to like interesting pieces of research that they may want to reference in what they're, whatever they're covering, I think that's actually very valuable. Now, separate to that, I think that it is useful. There are enough people who still prefer going to websites Maybe they like Twitter, but they don't like Facebook. Maybe they like Facebook, but they don't like Twitter. That happens. So I think you always want to have that sort of a presence in case you're doing something like a petition or donation or whatever it may be, just to catch people who aren't sort of involved in all of these different mediums. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> I, I want to take something Scott said and sort of take it out a little bit. He said when you're doing something that's bre when when democratic leadership wants to do something that's breaking news they put it on twitter when they want a discussion for a couple of days they put it on facebook when they want you to find it forever they put it on their website right i mean that's sort of a a simple principle i mean it's sort of more of an archive it's more of a longer term thing so it's not just an easy place to go but it's it's got just a, a longer longer half-life that we're dealing with. It will, it will also impact what people are finding when they're doing a search. So if it's something where you really want to raise public awareness and you know that there's going to be, I don't know, like some CNN Heroes thing that touches on it or whatever, you want something there that's going to be able to impact your search so that if somebody goes looking, that's going to be in like the first five things that they see when they Google because they're probably not going to go to page two and they may not even scroll to the bottom of the first page. We have another question from the audience in the back. Um, Brad, this is a question for you and also, I guess, uh, primarily for the folks who are still working on the Hill. Um, there's been a lot of efforts made to make sure that communications to congressional offices are coming from constituents. So there was, and, and if you look at your own survey where you're talking about um, valuing the, the perspectives of constituents, when you go into the world of Facebook and Twitter, um, doesn't that allow you to break through that barrier and have uh, comments from folks all over the country showing up on an individual member's Facebook page, and, and how does that balance out? I'll speak briefly and then turn to the, the Hill staffers. You know, there's been this complaint over time that, you know, computers allow uh, Capitol Hill to filter out non-constituent communications coming to Capitol Hill. And my reply is we always had filters for non-constituent communications. We just used to call them interns. Um, we, that's what my job was when I started as an intern on Capitol Hill in 1983, sorting non-constituent mail. You had a big stamp that referred it someplace else. Um, one of the things that we found right now in our research is that they're not as obsessed with constituents 
uh, on their Facebook and their social media because they love the authenticity of it. If somebody says you're doing a really good job, members of Congress like to hear that, and they don't care if you're from Oklahoma or California. They're politicians. They want to please people, and so hearing that makes them feel good. That's the type of personalities they are. That's the way it is right now in October 2012. Could it change next month, next year? I don't know. I'll turn to the Hill staff and say, what do you guys, how would you respond to that? Uh, I would say, uh, I would agree with Brad and that um, members of Congress do really care about that in constituent mail. Like they literally do just exclude, you know, non, it usually gives more of a form response to non-constituents who send mail. But on, on Facebook, yeah, we don't really know and we generally don't really care. Um, we, uh, you know, if somebody's really active and sort of posting all the time, and especially if they're incredibly negative, and they happen to be not, you know, be a, a district from the district, then we're certainly, you know, not going to pay attention to that person nearly as much, you know, but as we would if they were in the district, because it's easily to click away. But you know, most of the people we don't click through to see where they're from. We don't have the time for that. Um, so I would, and and even though a lot of members are against, uh, you know, don't want to waste time on non-constituents, a whole lot of members have you know, national ambitions or, or statewide ambitions or whatever. So they, I think they see it as a, as a plus. They're not restricted in the rules of the House in the way they were when you actually know who the constituents are. Right. I'd say that uh, constituent management systems and constituent mail are still the bread and butter for most offices. Not very many members will ask, you know, who's tweeting about this, but they'll ask, you know, how many people wrote in, how many people called about a certain issue. Uh, but I think you should also augment that with social media. For example, if you at tweet, it's uh, something, a function on Twitter where you can send a message directly to somebody's account, there's a good chance that a senior staffer or a member will actually see it. Um, quite a few members actually tweet themselves and will check and see it. And it's kind of a unique opportunity that you may not have if you're just writing in or calling an office. All right, we have a question from Twitter from ALS Advocacy. Can you guys please speak to getting non-for-profits to move past the dreaded online form letter campaign? <laughs> the dreaded online form letter campaign. How would you speak to that? Anybody want to say? Um, I'll, I'll throw out there that there was a recent study that was done, I believe, by Fish and Strategy and written up by Roll Call. And one of the points that comes out of that is that quality really does trump quantity. And I think people need to pay attention to that. You can send a thousand form letters, and I guarantee you, based on what that study shows and what other studies have shown, that that is not going to be as useful as having like a couple of individual personalized emails, a couple of individual personalized tweets, maybe some good commentary on Facebook that actually delves into an issue and is more than just sort of the usual talking points, that kind of thing. So I think it's important to, to diversify that and make sure that it's really authentic and it's not just the same thing repeated over and over again. I would also say, from the Hill's perspective, uh, I've been seeing more petitions lately. I think those, as long as there's some verifiability and you trust the organization putting them together, I think that might be an alternative to the dreaded uh, form letter campaign. Um, but I also think there's still value in form letters. They still get counted. They still get into the CMS database. And um, they still, from the database, then get on the mail report. You know, most members of Congress, how they see all of your communications is at the end of the week, usually, they get a, a mail report. And that, you know, traditionally had the number of phone calls and, and, and emails coming in. Lately, it also, you know, often has social media metrics as well on that. You know, usually just a one-page page report. Here's a snapshot of what we're hearing. And so, you know, the form letter campaigns, they still, uh, they certainly impact those reports. Sure. You know, in the end, and this is, this is again, going to sound a little bit old school, instead of form letter campaigns, do a staff meeting in a district office or something like that. I mean, yeah. talk to actual human beings. These are that we, we face a, a challenge because the, the, it's so easy and trivial to you know, click a like or send a form letter. They do get discounted, and they get discounted for a very good reason. Yeah, you're, you, know, you count however many thousand you got, but okay, so you got 50 more. So what? You know, I mean, it's, that's, not, that's not impacting any staff member or any member's decision-making process. Now, the flip side to that, however, is when you look at a lot of these pe petition campaigns, I don't think the petitions are for the politicians. The petitions are for the groups that's right. that are building their, their building. constituency. And so it might make sense as something that's not targeted just to your membership, but to target as targeted as a way to expand your membership or to expand 
your advocacy list, which then you can turn around and do actually, you know, much more useful things. I shouldn't say actually useful things. That's unfair. But much more useful things, like get in-person meetings mm -hmm. with another two people. Right. That actually changes the way members and staff think about things. Right, and I, and I just add that there are a couple of things that technologically out there I've seen that I think better facilitate that sort of individual interaction, which I think is the thing that ultimately gives you the bump. Um, one, there were some folks who, various folks who've been working on Twitter tools that make it easier for somebody who's, say, visiting, I don't know, um, let's just say randomly, like the ASPCA's website to actually go there, tweet, tweet from their account, not something that's necessarily totally scripted, but something that's adaptable. Mm -hmm. I think that's useful. Um, also, full disclosure, these guys are a client of mine, but there is a firm that is working on um, doing a lot more technologically to survey internal organizations' abilities, um, like to figure out if the person who's working in I don't know, the accounts department happened to have interned for Chuck Grassley at some point 10 years ago and still maintains contact with him, and whether that person maybe would make a phone call but doesn't like doing emails, that kind of thing. So I think there are a lot of these things that are going on that are aimed at enabling organizations to better diversify their communication, but I think the point, regardless of how you're doing it, is that you have to make sure that it is personal because if it just looks like the same thing, it will get tallied as a number, but I'm not sure that that really makes an impact on the decision maker in the same way. I, I would agree that personalized messages are better than form letters, and in-person meetings are invaluable. So. I would only add on, on the petitions, please don't use petitions to raise money, and please don't tell people you're going to send a message to Capitol Hill and then move them onto a fundraising page in the next screen. Um, it's a little fraudulent, and organizations do that occasionally. I see it in the nonprofit world occasionally. Um, it's really a disservice to the constituent, and it's a disservice to our democratic dialogue because that constituent's not going to get a message back if you don't send it, and it really sort of interferes with the relationship between citizens and Congress. Scott, you wanted to make a point. I did, yeah, just to second the comments down from my colleagues here in the end, that from an organization standpoint, yes, the, the campaign form letters are great and things of that nature, but to, I think each of you said the power of the personal interaction, whether it's in the local district or you know, up here, you know, how many times you know, have members and staffers been able to come and say, you know, that, that wife, for example, who's coming to tell the story who lost her husband to a heart attack and is coming to say why well, we need to invest more in research or a, a certain campaign or a program, you know, that the power of that personal story and that passion that that advocate brings is definitely something that we can't lose in the conversation. Well, that said, emails get read and get used. For example, um, one of the quotes my boss use, uses most often, he's probably used at least 50 or 100 times now, comes from a letter that a constituent wrote in as part of a campaign um, talking about her situation. And uh, he asked his um, legislative correspondent to look through the emails, look what constituents had written about this issue, and uh, give him a few of the most compelling cases. And he really uses to highlight the issue. Mm -hmm. We had a question over here. I know the gentleman right in front. Yes, very briefly. Um, the congression. This is a tactical question. The congressional staff briefing. So. I do probably about a half a dozen congressional staff briefings for clients a year. I suspect that the combined briefing output in the room here is probably several hundred. And so, so just two very quick questions. Number one is, um, so just your rating on their effectiveness. Do you think that congressional staff briefings today are still effective as a communications tool for congressional staff? And then secondly, generating turnout at a congressional staff briefing. So the Typically, the clients judge the effectiveness based upon how many congressional staff attend, and, and are there are there specific uh, things that we can do to generate increased audience, assuming that, that they are still effective. Anybody want to tackle the, um, the, the staff briefings? Uh, I, the ones that have the biggest crowds always are the ones that have food. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's not rocket science. You guys already know that. Um, the uh, I think it's certainly the number of staffers that are, are, are there is important. It's also obviously important just to you know have a pretty full room. I mean, I think a lot of the briefings, a lot of offices send interns. That's obviously not nearly as valuable as having congressional staff in there. So I think if you wanted to have a metric and how effective they are, certainly knowing which how many are interns versus staff is important. Um, but I, I, they're in person. They're not as personal as individual meetings, uh, but they still are you know uh, in person contact, which I still think is very uh, very effective. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd also suggest that you look for partners uh, who are interested in that issue 
and have those st staffers of those members send out either a dear colleague or send out an email to their colleagues. Um, I find that's probably the most effective way to get people to go to a meeting. Um, and usually if it comes from a very trusted source within Congress, uh, you will get high turnout. Also, I would do a recap of the meeting since a lot of staffers are too busy to attend or it conflicts with their schedule. And then if you have an email list, send it out to that. And I would be much more likely on a percentage basis to read that report than I would be to actually attend the meeting just given my time constraints. And I can push it off, read it at 11 p.m. or whenever is convenient. And the last, oh, go ahead, Scott. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, traditionally, you know, for organizationally, from our standpoint, we've always dreaded the congressional briefing. You throw a party, you never know who's going to show up. You pray that a lot of staffers and members come. Uh, I think some of the best practices that we've seen is, you know, linking up, uh, as you kind of mentioned here, with our, our friends and our champions within the Congressional Men's Health Caucus. So co-hosting it as an organization outside nonprofit with our, our friends, in this case, Congressman Runyon and Congressman Schuler, who are, have an interest in the topic, and then being able to bring out and march out a lot of those key thought leaders. So our, our most recent one was on TBI issues. And we had um, the NFL come and tell their story, the VA, the DOD, so linking the athlete and the military angle. So I still think the free lunch certainly is important, but marching out some of those speakers that folks want to see. And then you know, my colleague Kamai being able to leverage you know, Twitter, uh, Facebook, and then also YouTube to really memorialize the event. So capturing a lot of that content on you know, whether it's a flip video cam or an HD camera, and then being able to effectively tell that story after it's over to extend the message and be able to share the message via social media and other outlets after it's over and completed. The last thing I'd add is it has to be tied to the world of Congress and what they're working on at that particular time. Um, if you try doing a farm bill briefing six months or eight months before the farm bill is coming onto the floor for a vote, they've got 25 million things they got to do before that floor vote. But if you do it a month before and you're providing it to young staffers, remember the average age of a House legislative assistant is 27 years old, average number of issues they cover are 12. You know, its timeliness is the key thing to getting the attention of staff or by email or in person. Oh, I would just second uh, about the celebrity thing w works too. You know, if you have a big name, obviously people are going to come. Uh, NASA had an awesome briefing I went to just two days ago. They had a, a, this guy who's an astronaut and a former NFL player. So it, that was the top of the email invite. And they also had lunch, and even, it was packed. Yeah, or even if the name sounds familiar, one of my favorite uh, events uh, invited you to attend an event with Steven Spielberg. And it was not a filmmaker, it was another person named Steven Spielberg <laughs> who worked on the issue. And the headline, like, that was, you know, instant read. <laughs> so ask your executives if they'll change their name to Lady Gaga, and you got. Yeah. Let, let me change the, the, the topic a little bit and shift a little bit. One of the things that many organizations face, because this is a, a, a topic that has really come very fast, and a lot of senior executives and nonprofits and associations are. Well, not with the times. I, I think of the, the executive of the association that thinks broadband is an all-girl orchestra. Uh, and some of the challenges that people face are, frankly, internal, not external. Talk a little bit about how uh, organizations, if they are facing internal resistance to change, to innovation, to, to indeed risk, whether that means opening up social media, which is a great unwashed democratic forum with a small d. Uh, talk a little bit about how to overcome internal challenges to embracing social media. I'll jump in. Uh, I, I've done a lot of this over the years with members of Congress in our leadership position, work, working with Stephen as well, on um, we have to, con it's part of our job is just convincing members of Congress, many of whom are, are much older and uh, don't know much about these social networks at all, uh, convincing them uh, and their chiefs of staff to, to really you know, prioritize this. And I, the one thing I always go, you know, try to stay focused on is money. Uh, it's not that expensive you know, to get involved in these social media networks. Um, I know on Congress, probably same as you, uh, you know, we all still have huge chunks of our budget that are dedicated to direct mail, paper, you know, postage. That is so much money. I always say uh, my, my favorite talking point is, you know, for the, if you, you know, instead of having three direct mail pieces a year, if you just eliminate one of those, you can more than uh, well fund, you know, and a, a great online presence and all the social networking and brand new, you know, gorgeous website, great emailing tools. Um, so it's, it's, and, and then you really got to show them that that how cost effective it is. I think analytics really help. I think Facebook analytics are awesome. I think uh, a lot of people don't understand that the exponential growth potential of, of Facebook and, and Twitter. Um, but you know, if you show them, if you have a really successful post on Facebook and you can show them that it can so easily reach so many more eyes, even then you have followers, uh, that is, is really powerful. I, I, I want to echo the cost point. I mean, that's really, 
you know, stepping back, you know, we, we, we have all these, you know, these nice shiny objects we can talk about. But what's happened is that the cost of communicating has fallen to almost zero in a lot of cases. And the cost of advertising has fallen dramatically too. I, uh, and your ability to target them has fallen, you know, his, his, I mean, it's, it's mind blowing the amount of targeting you can do. I had I, I was working on a on a on a Senate race and we had we were looking at our polling and we were not doing as well with women as we wanted and we could buy women you know, buy the eyeballs of women on YouTube in certain age ranges. Did they come in binders or they no? no. <laughs> um, you know, so, so you could buy ads that would only show to women between 35 and 45, for example. And we, we did it in some targeted counties, and we pulled it afterwards, and it worked. And it was, you know, one, you couldn't do that any other way. There's no other way of accomplishing showing, an, you know, showing some sort of message just to those people. And it was relatively cheap. I mean, frankly, the poll was about as expensive, or, you know, you know even, the, even the tests were, were as expensive as actually, as actually buying the advertising. And that's, I think, the, the best argument. The other thing is you get to keep it. Right, that's, that's the other side. As you, the, the, the important thing about digital is it's interactive. And so often you get to own the relationship afterwards. And it builds on itself. And it builds. And, and so I was, I was actually talking to, a, to, a, to someone who was worried about what they would do to, to, to uh, get their message out this cycle. And one of the arguments for a campaign that was built primarily around Facebook and email is that you owned that asset at the end of it. You, know, you, own, you had the, the lists and that you could continue to communicate with. And those two things, I find, the cost and the fact that you actually build a relationship with individuals is a incredibly persuasive point with people. I, I'll, I'll, Liz? I, I, think that's, I think that's true. I suspect, um, for those of you that are having trouble with this, though, where you're hitting resistance is, oh my god, but if we start engaging with these people online, they're crazy. They're absolutely crazy. We can't control the message. What is going to happen? I, there's a lot of that that you get in politics. And my general response to it is, those people are going to be there and they're going to be talking about you whether or not you're there. So if you're not involved in that, you have absolutely no chance of controlling it, directing it, moving it, reshaping the environment any of those things. You're basically saying, I will just allow chaos to persist and I will take a totally hands-off approach to it and we'll just see what happens, which is, it's, it's a recipe for disaster in my opinion. So I think in some respects, if you're getting the fear argument, it's best to push back at that with fear. And I think the other thing that I would tie into that is one of the things that tends to happen where there's fear is Okay, well, we can do it, but let's make sure that before we issue like a single tweet, we have 10 people sign off on it. Let's make sure we have a really extensive approval process. Um, I don't personally gel well with approval processes. Um, Soren has worked with me. He can tell you that. Um, I think uh, <laughs> it's probably the nicest possible way it's of true. putting it. Um, I think it's really important if you are going to try to make a major push getting into the social space to have an idea beforehand about what you, as the person who will be controlling and managing it, need that process to look like. Because if it turns into, well, you have to have the communications, and you have to have research, and you have to have legal, and you have to have whoever, like the head of your organization's offices, sign off on it, and then it has to come back to you, and then it has to go through communications again. That just isn't going to work with something like Twitter, where it's now, now, now. What you need to do is have something designed in the first place that avoids that whole discussion, get them to sign off on it, and go. I'll just add on the cost point. A friend of mine at the Beekeeper Group uh, said once Facebook is free, like a puppy is free. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a point to that is that it is, an, it is an investment, but as these panelists have said, there's a return on investment and there's a measurable return on investment. Unlike direct mail, which is very hard to measure, or television or other kind of advertising, the wonderful thing about the internet and all the wonderful toys associated with it is you can count who's involved. We have a question in the back, I know over here, speaking of beekeepers. Hey, hi, uh, Mike Panetta from Beekeeper Group. A lot of groups in town do um, not just grassroots, but grass tops. 
And a lot of groups in town also do issue monitoring. Um, for example, the stuff we do for issue monitoring, we'll drill down and see who's talking about that issue and are they influential? Is it somebody to listen to? Is it somebody that we should pay attention to? I'm wondering if any of that happens on Capitol Hill with the Facebook tweet, Facebook posts and the tweets. Is there any sort of research to find out, is this person an influential back in the district? Is this person talking for hundreds or thousands of people? Or is it just somebody who's, you know, his, his cat mittens follows his Facebook feed and that's about it? Uh, yeah, I've actually seen um, some of the, the Hill vendors, uh, our social media and website vendors have sold that sort of process where they'll analyze your database and they'll actually tell you, you know, who are major movers and influential people um, based on, you know, that, whether that email account is associated with other online accounts and different websites and everything. So I've seen it. But at the same time, I don't know that it's actually being used all that much, to be honest. That would be my guess. Um, although I certainly I think that's more and more important in the future you need to prioritize you know who you're communicating with but right now I think it's more just the, the old-fashioned trying to communicate with everyone who communicates with us you know and that's uh, more than enough work to keep your average congressional staff busy and I think yeah it's definitely in its infancy now but I think over the next two years you'll really see that change uh, more of the content management vendors are looking at integrating uh, with social media um, I know there are a few products now they're looking to correlate email addresses in your online and your uh, constituent database with Twitter accounts, so that the member can start following everybody who is in their opt-in list. Um, in terms of looking at from a broader perspective, few offices use sophisticated analytics tools like Radian Six or anything. I mean, just because they're so expensive, um, and uh, if at all, you'll see maybe one or two leadership offices using it, but yeah, most can't I, afford. I, I, I would add on like uh, the. The CMS systems that we use on the Hill, um, they were rather static for a while, but just in the past year or two, they're really uh, growing quite a bit. There's new competition in the market. There's new companies that have come on the Hill. Um, and, and I think that you know the examples that Stephen just gave about integration with uh, social media and, and different database tools uh, is exactly what they're taking advantage of, and we'll see more and more of, I'm sure, soon. From the opposite side, I would I would say that I do think that there is increasing attention being paid to that. I mean, I think Soren can speak to this just as well as I can. Um, if you have Republican members who spot that Eric Erickson goes on Twitter and trashes them, that is going to get their attention because probability is that that is going to lead to other people who are in their districts causing some sort of a problem, particularly if it's on something as significant as um, immigration reform, health care reform, the taxes, those kinds of things. Um, and I think that's particularly the case given, um, you know, we were talking about the BRICS example. I think there are more and more online activists who are starting to do weird and attention-grabbing offline tactics like the BRICS thing is a good example. Another example um, that I like a lot looking at red state was when Olympia Snow actually voted to pass Obamacare out of the finance committee. Red State actually effectively bailed out a company that was about to shut down in Indiana that produced rock salt. And this was written up by the Wall Street Journal because they encouraged readers to go onto Amazon, buy huge bags of rock salt, and ship them to her office in Maine. You can't help but notice when, like, you know, 300 bags of rock salt show up and are, like, sitting in front of your door, right? So I think when things like that start happening, and there's been more and more of that, and there are other great examples that are not appropriate for the camera, but you can come and talk to me about them afterwards, I think that that, that creates a situation, certainly when you're looking at the Republican side of the aisle, where if you start seeing the guys at Red State really going after you on something, even if it is just on Twitter, you pay attention. I would also point out, especially when you're inside the district, this, this really illustrates a, a staffing problem in congressional offices that they haven't figured out. People in the district know, who's, know who in the district is important. People in Washington, you know, in the, in the D.C. offices right over here, they're not always as attuned to this. And, and one of the interesting things that I think may happen over time is more of the district staff could be, become more involved in the, in the recognition and decision-making process. There's so much knowledge about what's going on that's left on the table by sort of weird staffing decisions that I think they're going to have to address that at some point. And it's, it's starting. You know, you see some of it, but yeah, we Just point out, Congress hasn't seen the staff increase since 1974. It's the last time it went up. Gas was 55 cents a gallon. So 
that's, it is a static challenge. We had a question over here, sir. I know you wanted to ask it. You've been patient. Thank you. Yeah, you've been talking a little bit about cost and how the cost of communication is effectively zero. It seems for small organizations, the cost is measured in time rather than in finances. And so there's a temptation for small organizations to look at tools like Hootsuite that enable you to pu make one post, a blog post that can disseminate to Google Plus and Facebook and Twitter. Can you talk a little bit about the effectiveness of that if, or whether you really need to be tailoring your message to each one of the platforms? Stephen? I've always uh, been a proponent of uh, t taking the extra time to, to tailor your message to the different um, programs because I just think that there's there's different expectations you know certainly in Twitter and Facebook there uh, the character limitations and you really need to optimize that and, and it's too important to leave to a program um, and I and I argue that it's not that much more time I mean if you're already putting uh, together a headline you know it's it's not that much harder to, to customize the headline a couple more times for the different um, platforms I, uh, no, Scott? Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, from our perspective, you know, Hootsuite has been a very valuable tool. I know my colleague Kamai uses it uh, daily. It's a great way to you know, schedule things and, and kind of coordinate our social media approach and tactics and messaging. So certainly for us, it has been a great tool and something we do use very often. So. Probably, yeah. Also want to look at your audiences, too. I mean, on Twitter, you may have more reporters, more kind of people who are discussing the policy involved versus on Facebook. Maybe you might have more people who are kind of the issue has affected them personally and they want to like the organization because of that. It, it depends on your situation, so you want to tailor it to that, but also how you use those uh, tools differs. For example, on Facebook, um, a lot of organizations now will post a picture and that picture shows up in your Facebook feed and it draws a lot more attention than if you have text. On Twitter, you have to click on the tweet and it pops open to see that picture, so it's not nearly as effective on that tool. So you really have to customize it to whatever thing you're using. And there's also a lot of really low um, cost ways you can tweet. Just start an account now, tweet out articles that are interesting. Usually the approval process for that is pretty quick, because assuming it's a non-controversial article, and it's a lot easier than creating original content, and at least you can start building that base of people who want to follow your organization. So if you decide to move into that and take a more expansive role, you can and you'll have a much bigger following when you do that. Let's build on the, the, the tools question and, and expand it beyond just Hootsuite. What are some of the other emerging technologies, emerging tools, both on the Hill and off the Hill that this audience might be interested in? Oh, you guys go first. I'll, uh, I, one really interesting area I see uh, is new social tools that are targeted directly towards the um, legislative process. Uh, so I think, I think uh, my colleagues in the Republican leadership deserve some credit. They, they came out with UCUT and uh, Citizen Co-Sponsor. Uh, those are two tools uh, that allow the public to weigh in um, in a public way on legislation. Now, I would argue that they're very limited in that they only include a small number of bills that are GOP priorities, so they're not very useful to left-leaning um, groups or, or uh, advocates. Um, but there's new tools as well. Like, I think a really good one, which I think is in the panel right after us, is Popbox. Uh, House Democrats recently just started using that tool in an official capacity. Now, Popbox is nonpartisan. We just started using them, um, and we, you know, would be happy if, if uh, the, our Republican colleagues also started using them. But they do two important things. One is they, if you channel communications through Popbox, uh, like constituent communications letter to, to members of Congress, um, they deliver them to the member of Congress, but they also allow them to go up on their website and essentially like a big public scoreboard on how many people are pro or, or con on a particular bill. So that's important, and we actually want to show that to our members. We want to show our members of Congress, you know, what the score is uh, in the public that have used Popbox on p particular bills. And secondly, very important, they... Uh, they're an online repository for all advocacy position papers on bills, which I don't think has really ever existed before. Um, so you can actually go on there and you can see, uh, pick any bill, all 15,000 roughly bills in the 112th Congress are on there. And for any given one of those, you can see um, a number of letters from advocacy groups like yourselves or the Chamber of Commerce or anyone else. And you can see uh, you know, those letters, who is pro and who is con, and the actual letters about those specific bills. Now, obviously, most bills they don't have any letters for. but. Um, so us and House Democrats, well, we did just simple things. We, we started importing those letters into our own databases where we keep track of documents on every single uh, bill that's out there, like the official Democratic line and talking points on the different bills. bills. So th that's a good tool that we've been using a lot and think has a lot of promise. Anything off the Hill that you, that, that's out there that's uh, what's after Twitter, what's in the post-Twitter world? Um, I think it's worth taking a look at Pinterest, particularly if you are looking to target women. 
Um, last I checked, Pinterest's uh, demographic was something like 80 to 85 percent female. So if that's important to you, it's probably worth having a look at that. Um, I think in addition to that, obviously for organizations that have a lot of visual content, the fact that it is essentially clipboarding, um, that's probably going to be very conducive to you getting a lot of your messages out. It's something that um, a lot of political candidates are sort of struggling to get to grips with, but more and more of them are trying it. I see a lot of potential for it in the advocacy space, though. Well, we've talked a lot at the national level, but what about the local level? Are there examples that you can cite of great uh, case studies at the local level that may be transferable to either state legislative campaigns or at the federal level? Anything local that's, that's got your attention? Well, I, I will say a lot of, a lot of local organizations like churches, local community groups, often have much more vibrant communities, you know, much more vibrant communities online, partially because they have much more vibrant communities offline. And, and they've been able to effectively leverage those. I mean, you know, the, the, that's, that's the whole argument behind things like community organizing. I mean, you get a bunch of people that are near each other, that have a relationship, and then you figure out how to leverage that. And, and, and so that's, while I'm, I'm just having a brain blank right now, that's, that's been my experience of where things are, are most effective. Those are the people that are good at getting people to show up to things. Those are the people that when, you know, granted it may only be 30, 50, 100, but when they get fired up, they actually, they're much more likely to do things because they're invested. It's not, I mean, that. As I said earlier, there's, a, there's always this challenge. The more tenuous your relationship is with something, oh, I just like this thing, but that's it, the less likely you are to actually do something and become a genuine advocate. And, and uh, in general, I think local organizations where they see people face to face, where they interact on a more regular basis, have been much more effective at, at generating that sort of passion. And so a key, a key aspect is work, taking your group and doing sort of coalitions work at the local level and getting people really invested and in getting those people to advocate for you rather than just sending out a blast email. Mm -hmm. I wanted to, I wanted yeah, to Scott. echo your comment there, Soren. We've, we've, um, part of our mission is, is hosting free health education screening events. We've linked up with NFL teams and specific markets to do this. Mm -hmm. One of the, the strategies is linking up with the local fraternities in the area, the veteran service organizations, the faith-based institutions, the Masonic and other related organizations. But even then, from a social media perspective, tying in with the NFL team fan base. So if they have 500 thousand folks that like them on Facebook and their, uh, their Twitter following and things of that nature. It's such an effective way to reach out to a gigantic fan base in that local community to be able to spread all kinds of messages, whether it's a health education message, a come out and take advantage of a free service, get involved, raise your voice, tell your personal story. There's so many creative things that we can do with that. Before I go One more. Uh, a great example, we recently had, uh, Brad mentioned our contest. So all of our members are thinking of creative ways to boost their online presence. And one was really great. It was uh, from uh, Representative Moran in, in Virginia. And uh, it, it was not, I guess it wasn't local per se, but it was a small advocacy group. It was uh, a, an animal rights group. And he released, during the contest, he released a bill that banned uh, the, the, the killing of, of pets in gas chambers. Now, who knew that was an issue? Uh, but apparently some states still actually, you know, had that on the books or whatever. And so he worked, he, he, he overnight, he got over 2,000 shares on that one post of introducing that bill. It, you know, greatly increased his odds. He jumped right the top of our scoreboard on our contest. Um, and, it, and he must have been working with the animal rights groups because they were, of, co of course, sharing it to all their members as well. well it was just really effective overnight. It's interesting you mention animals because just as an aside, I have no idea whether anybody in this room deals in that area, but animal causes are one of the things that when I look around, it is the easiest to get people to engage and take meaningful action beyond just the like and to do it online and offline. Um, there's a horse rescue uh, and sanctuary that my mother's involved with in Seattle, and they initially, I don't think, were particularly focused on social media. They're focused on actually saving lives. Um, but I've noticed more and more over time they've gotten better about posting pictures every time they have a new horse come in and the number of comments has gone like completely off the charts. Like by the time that I go and post, I, I used to be like one of the first three people that's like, oh my God, the poor thing. Now I'm like number 108. 
So I think you know if there's if there's a way to take what you're doing and tap it into some sort of external interest like that or something, I think that's helpful. And I think again that sort of speaks to the importance sometimes of having visual content. I think people are very drawn to that. So get your boss to change your name to Lady Gaga and buy a puppy. Okay. Yeah. Good advice. Yeah. Last question. I'm going to start over here, Scott, and have everybody answer this question. Go down uh, the panel. Who do you follow on Twitter and why? Yeah, that's a great question. So, and I had meant to mention this a little bit earlier, but one of our strategies uh, early on, and we're, we're lucky as an organization because our executive director and our leadership is very bought into social media and was one of the early adopters. So for us, our, our Twitter strategy was following a lot of media. So going after media, getting them to follow us, and, and uh, being able to start that dialogue and start that story. One of the things we found to be successful uh, within the first week of having our Twitter account and having several national media outlets following us, we had got three phone calls for stories on related health topics that were of interest to our organization. And I think that immediately showed the value, showed the return on investment for us in social media. So from now forward, uh, that media strategy has been a big part for us. Who do you follow Same and why? Thing. A core component of folks I follow are uh, Hill reporters, uh, people who write about issues, uh, about what I'm working on, uh, Democratic and Republican communicators, but also uh, heads of different advocacy organizations. And sometimes, you know, I'll be sitting down with them and say, are you on Twitter? Great, I'll follow you. And, you know, so, so many people have Twitter on their phone now that you literally can sit next to somebody and just follow them. They'll follow you back. And it's a great, great way to kind of blend the um, real world with the online world. And I just note that I think report, following reporters is very helpful because A, you see what they're going to be writing about. They'll oftentimes do a lead tweet or kind of give you an indication about where they're going. But also they'll ask questions on Twitter too. And it's a great way to engage with them. You just type in at their name and say, you know, I think you should look at this or maybe this is something you missed. And I've seen corrections come about because of Twitter, mm -hmm. placements in articles. It's a super easy way if you don't have a direct connection to a reporter to get involved. Um, on the political side, I, I like to follow as wide as possible. So, you know, from the far left to the far right and everything in between. Um, it, I think it's important to see the perspective and, and to see the counter arguments, obviously, in anything you're doing, even if you uh, don't support the positions. And, and you obviously, in social media, you really, it's, it's like an a, a easy way to keep your finger on the pulse of, uh, of all the different segments of the country so you can see what's trending and what's getting hot. Um, and, and I also pick up on the, I have a small policy portfolio. I handle uh, tech, telecom, and science. And so in those areas, more and more, uh, the policy experts in the think tanks and the advocacy groups um, you know, are active themselves as individuals on Twitter. And I think that's uh, more and more important. Uh, so those are some of the top people I follow. So my work is primarily focused on online media outreach and blogger engagement. So understandably, a lot of the folks that I cover are, or a lot of the folks that I follow are folks who are covering politics and who are big names in the online media and blogger space. But in addition to that, we have a few sort of more mainstream reporters. And then um, obviously I cover, I co cover, follow friends and family, um, a blogger that writes about my uh, premiership football team. Um, and I also will admit it, I follow a cat called Socks a Million. <laughs> and you should too, because he tweets if you like cats. What he tweets is exactly what your cat's thinking all day long. <laughs> it's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. I don't want to know what my cat's thinking. <laughs> Usually they're thinking sleep, but you know. I, I echo a lot of this on Twitter. I, I tend to follow uh, media, uh, significant opinion leaders. Um, I tend to not hang out on Twitter as much as a lot of people just because I got a job to do too and, and I don't understand how people, no offense to some of my panelists, uh, have, the, have the time and really the attention to read back everything that's coming. Um, on, on the more personal side, you know, I, and this is really on Facebook where I think there's a, a lot higher level of emotional engagement, it's, you know, things I care passionately about, whether it's things like local community groups, my church, my, you know, my family. Um, the, there's, lots of, there's lots of other people on there, too, who, you know, come up and down, but, but they tend to not, you know, Facebook is good at this. It gives you the stuff that it turns out you actually care about, not the stuff you think you, or not the stuff you say you care about. And, and um, you know, so there's, there's a real division there. My, my experience is Twitter is useful for talking to elites, and Facebook is useful for elites or, you know, grass tops or whatever, whereas Facebook is really how you have a much more emotionally salient conversation with people. 
I want to thank our. Oh, excuse me. Yeah. Can I just make one final comment? I, I meant to say in new tools is uh, you all should be using the uh, the Obama the White House has the great uh, We the People petition site. And um, it's a great tool. It's an open tool. Any of you can get any of those issues on there. And if you have enough users, you know, like the petition, you can get an official policy response from the White House, which I'm sure any of you would love to have. Great. I want to thank our panelists here. If we could please give them a round of applause. Thank, thank our host here. And just uh, in, a, in a blatant plug, if you're looking for more information on this research, please go to congressfoundation.org. We also have a program called the Partnership for a More Perfect Union, which tries to get this information out. And I will turn it back to our panelists, our host. Thank you very much.